Hey guys, Dave from Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds, and today I'm hanging out with Wes Otis, and we're going to be talking about probably some D&D, uh, sound at the gaming table, and uh, plate mail games. So how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Good, good. So uh, yeah, it's a little early for you there, so you're starting off your day with Nerdarchy. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. It's not that bad, but yeah, it's, uh, it's about nine o'clock here now, so... Um, but I really appreciate it. Cool. So I, I take it you were into uh, sound or sound engineer before, you know, before doing this for tabletops. Well, yeah, I started um, I started as a dialogue editor and a film I mean, film restoration um, for I did film restoration for the Smithsonian. We did old films for DVD release. You'd go in and you'd take out like um Pops and clicks and all these different stuff. And uh, uh, I got to work on everything from like uh, Bridge Over the River Kwai to uh, Slugs from the 1980s. So a real variant of shows, um, which were, which really taught me a lot about audio. And then I got into um, doing uh, sound effects for cartoons. I worked for Warner Brothers and Disney um, for many years. Uh, and then I just uh, kind of, you know, after 2008, everything slowed down. Um, I did Scooby-Doo for a while and some SpongeBob. And then after that, I found I wanted to do more in gaming because I just, I love it. I've been doing it for 30, running games for like 30 years. So I started doing audio and then started putting stuff up on Drive through RPG and, and went from there. So you know, any, so. any of those sound gigs, did, did any of them, did you just hate them every day that you had to go on the work, you know, maybe not because of what you're doing, but because of the project you're working on? Well, I worked on, um, not necessarily hate board. There were some that are basic, like, um, we did some Hallmark movies that were like, you know, drive in a car, open a door, shut a door, sit down, wait talking, talking, open door, you know, and, and they were easy to cut, but they were just like, okay, Green Lantern is a lot of fun. Cut, Superman punching someone in the face is a lot of fun, but being a Hallmark stuff, you know, a little slow. <laughs> I was thinking more of maybe like SpongeBob and some of the more maybe, maybe cartoons that maybe are less fun for an adult to watch. <laughs> well, I mean, luckily SpongeBob is one of those things where, um, you uh there's enough adult humor in there like for the parents that it's it, it can be fun um hard ones are for the toddlers like um mickey mouse clubhouse or something like that where you know was, or uh i worked on uh a show called callie's uh i can't even remember now but it's all zips and whistles and that that can be a bit like you know zip in zip out you know, a, a little tiring. <laughs> so, you know, how, how was, how was it making the transition from doing that stuff to go to marrying it to gaming, which is a hobby? Well, um, it was actually pretty easy. I started with, um, a horror track, um, which was thunder, uh, thunderstorm at, at horror house. And, um, I just said, okay, how long do I want, want this to be? And what do I want? Yeah, Sheriff Callie's Wild West. Yep. That's the one I worked with. Cody just said it. Thank you for reminding me. It's been a while. Um, anyway, I decided how long I wanted it to be, what I wanted to put into it. Um, I knew as a GM, I didn't want anything to be too loud that would make people go, suddenly looking at a speaker going, what was that? I wanted it to be able to loop without anybody knowing it. And so those were the things I focused on for all my stuff. Um, so that people can just take 10 tracks where their locations are for their game. So if they're in a tavern, they're in a dungeon or whatever, and they, they set up their playlist and then they just hit play on whatever they wanna use and, and go. And that's how it started. So have you always used sound and sound effects in your games? 
Yeah, yeah. One uh, for not as much as I do now because now I've made so many tracks, but I used to it, and it used to be things. I saw a problem with like, um, you know, like uh, sound. Uh, um, any sounds for movies or anything like that where you have these big crescendos or whatever and you're in the middle of a story you're like you walk into a bar and you hear crash and you're like oh, okay that doesn't work so having something that doesn't kind of set the pace is a lot better now I know for our group personally we've never used a ton of a ton of music in our playing. Like we, we had like two go-tos. We would like play the Conan soundtrack and uh -huh. go to the uh, Anvil of Crom for, for fight scenes. Mm -hmm. And then later we finally upgraded to, you know, gladiator soundtrack. <laughs> we were very right. uh, simplistic in that. And now I think you can also get like the world. It's the, the soundtracks are, there's a lot more of them. Now you can get like world of Warcraft and, you know, I would love the call soundtrack, not because I'd use it, but just because I'm a nerd and I think call would be fun. <laughs> Sometimes you just need the things. Yes, you just need stuff. I, I totally, totally get that. <laughs> so how many tracks have you done at, at this point? And guys, um, as always, in the description, you can find links to go pick them up if you want. Um, and also have a if you look on the front page just so people know if they go to drive through rpg i have a free sampler pack it's um six tracks two fantasy two horror two sci-fi that way you can pick it up you can listen to it see if you like it and and then make your decision from there but um i've done over 800 tracks in the past five years most of them are 10 minute long ambiences that go for all genres so we do you know sci-fi um fantasy cyberpunk historical all this different stuff but quite a few do you so do you have a favorite genre to score for um i really like cyberpunk and i really like horror stuff um those are the ones that i play the most of right now but it's hard. I play everything. So it's like picking a child that you like. Sometimes you like one child more than the other, depending on the day and the screaming. You know. So what are you playing for uh, cyberpunk and horror nowadays then? Well, um, actually my cyberpunk game ended right now. I'm playing um, a 1970s Cthulhu horror game, the cop show set in 1977, New York on saving throw and we uh it's a lot of fun it's you know that's that's my big horror game right now i just did a fate version a fate uh, mashup with planescape uh, a couple of days ago which was cool and um you know i would i really enjoy um sprawl and um uh the sprawl and and a few of the other new um hacks of uh apocalypse now or a pop uh, uh the apocalypse setting so those are always fun uh yeah like dungeon world apocalypse engine yeah yeah sweet those engine so, so do you do more gming or playing it sounds like you do a lot of gming i do a lot of gming i mainly gm um I just enjoy it. I enjoy coming up with stories and great ideas and then watching players go completely the opposite way. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Do, do you do a lot of prep for your games or do you kind of improv? I do a mixture. Like I, I feel like the, like you hit the plot point that you want in the story, like what your characters are going to, what your NPCs are gonna do, and leave it at that, and then improv the rest. It kind of works better because then you're, you know, you're able to move with the party instead of trying to slam them down one alleyway or whatever. I I think I, I've run more that way just out of sheer exhaustion of trying to get them to do the things that I think they're going to do. It's much easier to go with the flow as the GM. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
saw this recently on Twitter, and I think it's very true. For me, I think PMs are story enablers. We set up the world and we say, here you go. You know, where, you know, where are your heroes going to take us? And for me, that works a lot better than trying to, you know, shove people into one direction or another. For the guys at the bowling alley that resets the pins. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> sometimes they knock them all down. Sometimes they don't knock any down. You just never know right. what they're going to do. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Fantasy Grounds uh, College has a question for you. Have you mm -hmm. ever used the software and soundboard sound plant? It's fairly fairly low latency and ASIO compliant. It means nothing to me. It's I have not, like but but um, I can definitely check it out. Um, I have I have not actually done that. And uh, I'm surprised. Uh, I'm surprised he's not asking to put things over on Fantasy Grounds. They always do that. <laughs> They're very passionate about <laughs> Fantasy Grounds. Which is oh, I love, good. I love Fantasy Grounds. Um, I actually have it myself, and uh, um, uh, I always tell people, like, the big question is, it's like, oh, can I use your stuff on D twenty, or can I use your stuff on uh, streams or or whatever on my podcast? And uh, basically, Plate Mail Games is free to use on, you know, RPG podcast and. Twitch and anything else, as long as it has to do with gaming, uh, you can use it. Just mention us, and you know if you're if you're doing it for an audience, um, you know mention us. But I have no problem with people using, you know, stuff on uh, on, you know, for for streams or for their games online or whatever. So another question from Fantasy Ground College as well: Are you are you a fan of the older R? Telsorian Cyberpunk 2020 materials? I am. Um, I'm a fan of, oh, what is it? I played a great game of that a long time ago where I ended up killing everybody in the party because I was a mole. And it was, it's one of those games I remember quite fondly. <laughs> I know that's terrible. You know, you kill off party members and all that. But, um, um, I can't remember. See, the problem is, is I played so many games over such a long period that I'm now forgetting all the stuff. I, I remember fragments of games. Um, I enjoy Shadowrun as well. Uh, I just haven't found anybody that's been playing fifth edition lately. I should go to more cons. Definitely. The, yeah, uh, I think it's tough. Like I, I universally, I hear from people with Shadowrun is they, they love the world and setting, but maybe not so much the rule set. Yeah, it's very crunchy. And my my answer to that is check out the sprawl and just take what you like from the setting and use the sprawl um, uh, mechanics. You can use fake core. Uh, we did cyber system or cipher system. Right. Yeah, you just, you just say, hey, I really like this. That's why I did Planescape with fake core because I was doing a one shot. It's like, yes, I could have made D characters and did the same thing, but uh, I would have rather just done it quickly, you know, and, uh, you know, and especially you have to make up all that stuff anyway, because it's not out there yet. Yeah. And using yeah. a system that makes that really easy. <clears throat> Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. With like fake core, it's like, Oh, what's your aspects? And yeah. you know, it, it's really fast. So, uh, TrueMate, what different LARPs have you done audio and PDFs for? Um, all of my audio stuff can be used with LARPs. Um, I have a lot of friends that actually use my stuff at, at cons. Um, the biggest ones are like uh, High Society Ballroom, which has like a waltz going on in the background for you know, big parties and things like that. But you can use especially the horror stuff, which is all ambient, um, uh, Thulu's Call and things like that. You want to set up something in a LARP that's like a, a really freaky room, you can you can use any of the stuff. Most of the tracks are, are fine for LARPs as well. So do you find any particular one genre like challenging to 
to put music to as opposed to like you like cyberpunk and horror so i imagine they come to you a little bit easier um i think that um not fantasy but historical stuff can be a lot more challenging um because you're trying to capture a certain feel especially when you're talking about um like we have uh i have a, a track called uh mexican village and it's just a like a, it's for old west games and it's got this nylon guitar in the background like someone just sitting on the street playing the nylon guitar and you hear like uh, chickens and wind and it, it sounds like something that you would get from say um, the good bad and the ugly something like that uh, those are more difficult because you want to get you want to nail the, the feeling of a historical thing and most people's frame of reference is movies and uh, I remember we went to Disneyland and they had have uh, the Mark Twain boat, which is this old steamboat. And I went up on the top deck and was listening to the engine, listening to how the water, how the paddles hit the water. Really, really geeky audio things that you do when you uh, are a super nerd about a certain subject. But that's the kind of things I do when I put stuff into my tracks. My, uh... It's funny you say that, but I definitely you know, notice stuff like that when I talk to my attorney is also a sound engineer. <laughs> Weird combination. IP attorney, sound engineer. But yeah, <laughs> you know, we had we had run a game down at uh, Think Geek, and he had come and he was like ah, geeking out on all the you know the sound stuff and I want to say nitpicking, but not really nitpicking. But I like it's like when you do anything, when you see stuff, you're like you know you can't help but analyze it. Yeah, I think that's something that it's taken me. Uh, a long time uh, to not be an audio snob um, and realize that, you know, everything's opinion. There, there's, um, there's a ton of different things out there. And if it works for your game, it works for your game. And that's the thing you should use. Uh, everything, any other criteria you put on sound or, or gaming system or whatever, doesn't matter. It's like, does it work for you? And that's the thing for you. Well, I think the thing, too, is in our niche, you find a lot of people that are like us who are trying to do things professionally, but we're not professionals. <laughs> you know, so you, you can only work with what you got. Right, exactly. And I mean, there are some really impressive um, audio amateurs out there that I've heard. They're like, OK, yeah, you know, it's that's that's pretty impressive. Um, so. I, I just think it depends on where you are and you and your path and how much time and you know it's it takes a long time to build that house of of experience you know. Well, hanging out with Nerdarchy, I, I can assure you, your your socks will stay firmly affixed to your feet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's there's also just some things I just don't want to be an expert on. One day we'll get to the point where we can have a studio and then we'll have an expert to do the thing. Yeah, well, and I think that's the hardest part, especially about streaming. Um, and that's the one area that I kind of, my eye twitches a lot. I'll hear, I'll, I'll be watching a stream and it'll just be all distorted or there'll be all, I just hit my mic, all, the, all distorted or all messed up for one reason or another. And uh, I think I think it's just a matter of, you know, going out there and trying to learn as much as you can when you're doing streams and and everything, um, it can be difficult. It's, you know, live sound is not easy. You know, that's why those guys get paid a, a ton of money to do it, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So Elfbait has a question. Can you describe mm -hmm. how you set up your sounds for a session? Well, for me, I use, um, I just use iTunes and I put, like um, I have the locations that I think the players are going to go to in a scene. Cause again, you know, you got to kind of like, if it's Dungeons and Dragons and you know that they're going to go to a keep, find some kind of item or whatever, that's a little bit easier. But when you're dealing with like uh, New York city and they could go anywhere because they're following a lead and sometimes they'll go way off path. Um, I pick, uh, sounds that I think they're 
affluent locations that they're going to. And then um, I just build a playlist. So I'll have like 10 to 20 uh, audio, you know, tracks in the playlist. And if something comes up, if they throw me a curveball, I just go to search, put in the name of what I'm looking for. Oh, we went offline. We went offline? Mm. Yeah. Oh, we're back. I think. I think it's it's thinking. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are again. Um, but uh, I put... I, I put my list up of, of where I think they're going to go. And then if something pops up, I search and just grab it. Uh, you know, it, it works pretty well. So uh, how many games are you actually uh, involved in right now? Um, I've, well, right now I just have um, my 1970s New York game going on for saving throw. Um, but I'm going to be starting a podcast soon, soon for a Call of Cthulhu game. Um, I am going to be uh, having lunch with a friend tomorrow that I'm going to try to convince that we need to have a offline game, something like D and D or or, or whatever. That because um, I think that you know when you do stuff online so much, sometimes you miss having an offline game. So I'm going to try to get an offline game going soon. I, uh, I, you know, I totally agree with you because we, we record so pretty much all of our games. And then like the last time I actually played a game that wasn't recorded, it was so nice. I was like, wow, this is weird. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, I think a lot of times you can, um, because you have to be cognizant of the audience and wanting to entertain them. And that's really cool. But sometimes you just want to hang out with your friends and BS and, and uh, some streams are great for that. But sometimes, you know, you just, you really want that feeling of we're just guys hanging out or guys and girls hanging out doing a game and, and uh, that's it. So it's important. So uh, do you prefer, you prefer running or do you prefer playing? I like running a lot. I enjoy it. Um, uh, I think every GM should play and should play as, as much as they can because they learn from other GMs. Um, no one is an island, but um, I do prefer running myself. I, see, I'm the. I guess my thing is when I'm running, I want to be playing, and when I'm playing, I want to be running. Yeah, yeah I can see happened. that. <laughs> Well, I think a lot of times my biggest problem is that I'll come up with an idea and then it's like, oh, I got this great idea and I can't tell anybody about it for three weeks because I have to set it up and it has to go in into the storyline. And so I think that there's a loneliness to being a GM where you're like, look, I've got all these cool ideas and I can't tell you. So I'm going to go sit over here and not talk. Yeah, that part is definitely rough. It's always nice when you can have someone to bounce your ideas off of that isn't in the game you're playing. I'd, Absolutely. I'd, like we're nerds. We just want to nerd out about stuff and talk about stuff all the well, time. Yeah, well, yeah, I think you get to that point where you're like, oh, you know, I really want you to know about this, but you know, I don't want to spoil the game for you, so I can't tell you. <laughs> now, you were, say, you were saying uh, before we got started um, – that that your your wife is a choir teacher and she does you know she works with you on the music and stuff right she does a lot of the composing um she's a lot more fancy than i am uh she was uh she was she she's an opera singer her father was an opera singer her just a whole bunch of opera singers and so her level of of knowledge of music is way higher i was in a in a blues and rock band for years and that's about as far as i went but she actually knows a lot about the the, the ins and outs so she does a lot of the music um a lot of the music pieces and then i do all the sound effects and uh, um i can tackle the ambience midi stuff but when we're talking about a um actual score of music for a particular piece like i have a um I think we might have froze again yeah i think we did it i think it'll pick up though 
Yeah, let's see. Because it says we're still live in the back end of uh, the Google Hangouts. Yeah. And... Let's see. Might just need to catch up. It froze. No. We, uh... Technology. Yeah. And I, I'm experimenting with OBS uh, for okay. the first time. And it might not be cooperating a little bit. Which is really weird because the stream health in the back end of Google Yeah, Hangouts it's saying, really okay, weird. so um, they're saying that they can hear us, which is good. Okay, well, as long as they can hear. And so, yes, uh, as long as they can hear us, that's the main thing. Hopefully, uh, you'll be able to see us uh, moving around in a second. Um, but yeah, she does a lot of great things. And so uh, definitely, um, uh, I, I'm definitely lucky. I'm, I have her as a partner to work on this stuff. Now, uh, is she also a gamer? Oh yeah, definitely. Her dad actually played first edition back in the seventies and um, she grew up with it. And uh, yeah, she's a gamer. She, her favorite movie is Bloodsport. So <laughs> I, I lucked out. I really did. Sounds like a keeper to me. A gamer and favorite movie is Bloodsport. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm definitely lucky in that that case. Uh, so James uh, has a has a question. I've asked this question myself before. Uh -huh. I, I did not like the answer I got. <laughs> what are some recommendations for cleaning up live sounds? I've had a project dropped in my lap, and I expect I'll have to clean it up. Audio video files. Oh, that's always that's. You know, it's always fun when a producer comes in and he hands you a, an audio something when you hear a plane going over it and all this other stuff. Um, you can roll off the EQ on the bottom end. Um, so like 200 hertz, you roll it off um, and that'll take away a lot of the rumble. You can use a compressor to kind of try to keep some of the higher end stuff that you don't want or do a high high pass filter on it. Um, you know, reverb wise, you're just, you're kind of stuck. Um, you know, whatever room noise they got, hopefully they give you some clean room noise that you can use underneath your edits. So if you have to ADR something or have to have someone come in do it again you lay the you lay the audio underneath it so that um the room tone underneath it so it it kind of matches up to the original sounds that you did um but yeah it's it's tough i did low budget movies for a while and they'll come in and just horrendous oh you can fix this right uh no not on the budget that you have but Thanks. Anyway, I'll give it a try. Yeah. I um, mean, one of the things that I've been told about that kind of stuff is it's like, one, how was it recorded? And two, you're probably just going to make it worse, kid. <laughs> Leave it alone. Yeah. Yeah. There's not, there's not a ton. I mean, EQ will help. Um, and if you're doing ADR, we had to, so there was this movie with Jeff Fahey, which was Lawnmower Man. Um, and he did a movie called The Contract. Um, uh, it was this horror movie where he was basically playing the devil and he came in and the way that they recorded it was they had the, the actress was on one side of the table and Jeff Fahey was on the other side. And he was right next to a, a fireplace and it sounded like he was in the middle of a boiler. It was just <laughs> through the whole thing. You could barely hear him talking. Well, Jeff Fahey does not do ADR, he will not come in to re-record line. So we ended up having to have a voice alike redo the entire scene. And no matter what you do, it's never going to sound the way it needs to sound if it's that bad. Um, and so again, that's why audio is not a, um, a simple thing. It, it takes time and effort to learn, you know? So, uh, I think a question popped up from over on Twitch that came in earlier. They came in later and probably just didn't hear. Uh, do you bother with audio for home games, like using the old first Quest box set, or is it just for stream games? 
and basically we cover we pretty much covered that both in yeah. in home games and streaming audio can enhance the experience yeah absolutely i mean and the cool thing about um the one thing that i like about audio is just like movies let's say you're you're setting your players up for an encounter you can use audio to make them aware of the fact that something's going to happen, but they have no clue, start freaking out. So if you're watching a horror movie or, or whatever, a fantasy movie, and you hear that sting of, oh, this track just came on and, and we're, what's, what's going on? Um, that tension is something that you can definitely use a lot. Um, we also do tension tracks, which are like a minute to two minute long tracks that are meant to make characters make up make decisions so like they hear the track start and you go okay once this track is over you have to make a decision or something bad happens and what it does is it helps move the game forward move the game forward build tension it's just yeah just mm -hmm. engaging more of the senses is always good right exactly miniatures uh terrain you know, all of the, anything that you can bring into your game is always helpful, you know. Heck, they got companies now that focus on scents. <laughs> I saw that. Man, I, I don't know. There's some dungeons I wouldn't want to smell. Yeah, yeah. So, so Some enhancements we just don't need. <laughs> what was, uh, smell of vision what was that from? Futurama? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yeah, that was Futurama. Uh, so, uh, Marge Eggins has a question. Hey Wes, I love your I love plate mail. Your work is great. Off topic question about Foley. When we hear a dog whimpering in pain in a film or a game, are they hurting dogs to get the the FX? Please say no. <laughs> um you know that's usually a believe it or not, um I have never I know that they have if you're listening to an older, okay, so there's this this sound library from the 40s, which is the Fox sound library. And it's all the old, like, uh, movie sounds that you hear. Um, I don't know how ethical they were back then. Now, a lot of times, uh, you'll just have humans go in and, and do voiceovers. You'd be amazed at what um, humans do in in you know, cartoons and everything else. Uh, so no, we're not, uh, I don't know of anybody who's ever uh, taken a dog in a, in a studio just to record, be mean to them, um, because that would be absolutely terrible. Um, but the older sound libraries, who knows what those guys did with, uh, you know, they're out there on a location sound and they, uh, it was a different time. Um, but nowadays, like I said, I think it, I 100% sure it's probably all human reactions and stuff yeah it would, it, i was thinking about it too i was like well i guess you could train an animal to do something but like how would you train them to whine that would be that would be a tough one for well, sure and there's also dogs that just you know i mean trainers they have trainers go out and maybe there are dogs that just whine without you know actually having to do anything to that dog and you can record I've had lots of dogs that whimper and, and whine because they're excited or, or whatever. And you, if you find those dogs and record them, then you're not actually hurting a dog. It's just, that's, that's the dog's personality. Yeah. So, yeah, and that is the other thing you could just follow. And I'm sure that like a lot of sound effects happen that way anyway, where they just yeah. find where the things are going on that they want to put in the library and include them. Well, if you think about it, like, uh, you know, there are dogs that will whimper and whine when they're waiting on the other side of the door for their owner to open the door. So if you set things up where it's like, okay, we'll record this little 20 second thing before I open the door, you're fine. You know, no harm, no foul to the dogs. And, you know, I think that the days of hurting animals, at least, you know, from my experience are pretty much done. And whenever it pops up, the people who have done it are, uh, uh, you know, called out pretty hard and, and justly. 
<laughs> in my house, the, the humans are abused by the pets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had a cat once that I'd wake up in the middle of the night and he'd just be sitting on my chest, staring at me, letting me know that he could kill me at any moment. <laughs> Cats are great that way. Last night, my cat ended up with its claw hooked to my wife's face. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> it's funny. He's a, he's a little, par he's a polydactyl. And uh, I used to think that, well, he's got those extra claws on his each paw. So maybe, maybe he can't retract them. And then it turned out, no, he's just an asshole. <laughs> 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 Cats, uh, dogs are there to be your friend. Cats are there to, for you to serve them. Yeah, that 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 is sounds about right. I keep I keep trying to tell my wife we can take take the cat back to its Pico home because Pico <laughs> is the place that it was found. <laughs> He's just such a little jerk. He just loves to attack everything. Yeah. My noise used to just knock things off a shelf. Constantly. And he's perpetuated the greatest scam of all time. Like things my wife would freak out at the rest of us for doing, he gets away with routinely. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah. Pets are great though. You need them in your life. That's, that's my opinion. So your, your favorite games to run and play, are they the same? Um, yeah, they kind of are. I mean, I really enjoy Call of Cthulhu. I really enjoy Dungeons and Dragons um, and Fate. Um, like I said, I play so many different types of games uh, that it's hard to pick a favorite. Um, I've been really wanting to get back into D&D lately because, you know, you get that itch. You're like, I haven't played D&D in a while and I need to kill myself uh Latinus cube or whatever. Yeah, we we will mainly play D and D, but then we'll veer off and play other things. Right. But, yeah. You know, it's like we're always going to be a D and D group. Part of it is just like the the hiccup of going out and like learning a new system. Yeah, I think that that can be really the hardest thing for people to kind of you know there are so many systems and. Like Savage Worlds. I have Savage Worlds. Uh, I have the book. I played it a few times. I, I, you know, the system's fine. But I just don't have enough people to play a, a regular game. It's just yet another thing. Geeks have to be, um, you know, a very, uh, you know, studious bunch of people because we have to learn all this stuff to be able to enjoy our hobby and um sometimes you're just like i you know hero sounds fun and i'm sure it is but i just can't read a 600 page book i just can't do it and each person has to make their decision on which games they're going to put their most time into that that's kind of like our methodology is to try and find, find other gms to bring into the fold be like hey run this game and this way, what we only mean? have to know enough to make a character show up and be like, all right, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. Now, you just tell me what I need to roll. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. And that's that works, too. If you can find a person that knows what they're doing, um, help you out, and by all means, do it. That's that's a great way to go. So, uh, Shaman Bill has a question. I was going to use a dirty word here, I think. Okay. Uh, is there any recommendations for audio mood, mood, audio mood settings setting besides Sirenscape? That's literally what we're talking about, Shaman. Um, Plate Mount Games <laughs> puts out their own audio pieces uh, over on Drive Through RPG. There's a link in the description. You can check it out. There's also like a free sample you can download as well. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and um, I mean there are a lot. Um, it's funny because my first Kickstarter was in 2013. And it did really well. Um, it it kind of took off. And it amazed me how many audio people popped up about like four months after my first Kickstarter did really well. Um, and so there is a lot of stuff out there uh, that you can check out. Um, you know, not just my stuff, but but a lot of other people's stuff. It really depends on what your um, what your feelings are about. Uh, the audio you're listening to is it is it something you enjoy does it work for you um then it's the right audio 
Yeah, I imagine it's like a lot of things, you know. Do you like this part? Do you like what's being produced here? Yes or no? If it's no, then, you want yeah. to really find something that does. Well, and with, I mean, okay, so if you're talking about Sirenscape in particular, they have a cool app. Um, and so for somebody that wants to move around, like, oh, I want to have the music swell here, or I want to do this or that, um, that's that's a great thing. You can use that app to do that. If you just want to get, you know, professional grade audio that is mixed, uh, you know, at, at a really high level, and you don't want to, and you and you don't want to mess with an app, then you go with something like me or or Battle Bards or you know, uh, tabletop uh, tabletop audio. Um, there are a lot of different people out there doing different things. So Renee asked a question. I, I want to read the question, but I don't. I don't think you really need to answer it. Is there a recent <laughs> soundtrack you found particularly bad or distasteful in the sense that it does not fit the gameplay at all? I, I can only imagine, uh, yes, those are, to a certain extent, you're going to get that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, to call out anyone in particular, I won't, but <laughs> because you never but know. But you know it's, who you are, no. <laughs> but you know who you are. I'm not going to uh, vague, vague post, um, but uh, yeah, there's always going to be stuff that you're like, oh, <laughs> what were you thinking? Uh, but again, that goes back to opinion. Um, everybody, I have a perfect, I have a, a, if I can find something technically wrong with something, then I'll say, this is technically why, you know, there's issues with this. But from an aesthetic point of view, you know, I can't really knock anybody because, you know, people like what they're going to like. Yeah, true that. And and it's just rude. <laughs> it's the other thing. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not, you know, you don't want to be like, hey, man. There's no, there's, there's no reason to needlessly be a dick. Yeah. Be a dick yeah, you don't have to be. It's not 1982 anymore. You don't have to tell someone, you know, you suck. Yeah. <laughs> Besides, they, you know, a lot of people already know anyway. They don't need to be reminded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they know they're, they're on their own, like. Figuring it out. To, not to be hippy dippy, but they're on their own path. And at some point, you know, it, the only person that you can uh, judge yourself against is yourself. Am I better than I was six months ago as a GM? Anything else? I saw a post about um, Critical Role and Matt Mercer. And it was like, you know, I have players who want our game to be like Critical Role. And, you know, I don't know how to make it like that. And I'm like, okay, well, first of all, that whole table, of professional actors, they all do that for a living. They know what they're doing. They've, they've spent the time. Everybody can learn a skill. Just take your time and you'll get there. You don't expect, I mean, I would love to play like Angus Young from ACDC. It's not going to happen, you know? Like, so I'm not going to beat myself up because I can't play the solo from a whole lot of Rosie. Um, so I think that you have to totally be like, you know, am I better than I was six months ago? Great. Then I'm moving forward. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's kind of unfortunate when people like set the bar that high. Yeah. Yeah. And, and here's, um, here's the other problem. If we could all role play like critical role and had tables like critical role, well, there would be no point in critical role. Were you trying to put those guys out of a job? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and not only that, but I mean, learn from them. Watch what they do and say, hey, I really like that. I'm going to try to incorporate that thing into my uh, my game and, and take, what you, take what you can from. That's the whole point of watching other games or playing or it's just learning and then taking the bits that you can and improving on them and doing your own thing. Yeah, I, I really feel it like as a GM and actually in most things in life, if you focus on the things that you're good at and where areas that you excel, you're going to create a better experience all the way around. And because if you just focus on those areas where maybe you're not the best, you know, it's just going to overall bring down. Oh yeah. You have to like, you have to be like, okay, I know I'm strong in this portion of the game and that's what, that's going to be what I lean on. Why I try to work on the fact that, 
maybe I don't know this set of rules well enough, or maybe I don't understand this well enough. So you, you lean on the strong parts. And then when you're not playing, you read about stuff that you're maybe a little hazy on and, you know, work them up. That's it. You know, I, I ran a live stream game. I feel, felt like I barely knew the rules. So I just focused on the role playing and the players had fun and people liked watching that game. It, you know, it's just figuring out. I mean, now that could actually be the hard part is figuring out where your strengths and weaknesses are and just, oh, yeah. you know, going with those. Well, like, you know, um, uh, Tom Lommel, um, the dungeon master, he does, uh, he does Iron Keep on Saving Throw and he does a show the day before and the day after, or the day of and the day after of what prep. Uh, what's, you know, what he's going to do for that show, how he's going to, all this stuff. And he has a very different way of doing things than I do. But I still really appreciate watching him because I'm like, okay, um, you know, these are things that I would like to personally focus on. Even though, you know, I know that, you know, players are happy with my game, you know, you're, you can always learn. That is absolutely the truth. And, you know, the biggest thing is just have fun. You know, like, yeah. when, it, when, it, when it's, I know it's so lame, but like new DMs all the time ask, what should I do? You know, what's your biggest tip? I'm like, it's a game, have fun. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. that other Fine. stuff will come. Yeah. I mean, and most DMs, when they're talking about D&D, it's like, you think of Lord of the Rings, you know, when they first start out or something like that, where it's just like, huge, epic thing. It's like, no, 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 no. Down objective forced in between start simple and then move from there you don't have to you don't have to go to mount doom your first first time out just you know enjoy yourself a small campaign build outward and you'll be fine or you're just gonna break you're just gonna break in your play your, yourself as the dm you know right right away because when you realize your players right. don't give a rat's ass about going to Mount Doom or saving the world, they right. just want to burn down the tavern. Just murder hobo is waiting for you to say you're in a town. All right, who can I attack first? What can I? Yeah, what can I muck up here? How can I play Grand Theft Auto? Right. Yeah, I had a. I was running a Call of Cthulhu game, and I had a 14 year old kid that was playing in the game with us. It was at a. It was at um a, a game store. And the kid really wanted to, to try to munchkin all of Cthulhu. So he put all his points into um, power and, and all that. <clears throat> and he left, um, he left his decks at some ridiculously low number. And so like, he's like, all right, I got my character. And he, he made this perfect, um, this perfect like sanity resistant, you know, investigator. Um, and, and because he was young, he was just missing the point of the game, right? He, he didn't understand. Like you've, you know. We play Call of Cthulhu to go insane and gouge our eyes out. <laughs> yeah, and, and you're supposed to have some weaknesses. Like that's a big thing. You're not supposed to just run through the game. Well, you can, but most people want to go through and experience a story, not run through a game and kill everything that will get old but you know he was 14 but he missed some role and it ended up because it was his decks and ended up dying and i'm like well you know let's remake the character and let's maybe put a few more points in decks so that when you're running away from a monster you don't trip and you know get eaten you know so but everybody has that learning curve and 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 what works for them you know uh, ain't that the truth? So that's actually one of the questions I want to ask you. I want to ask you about is running Call of Cthulhu. I've never actually played in it, and I, the uh, the idea of playing Call of Cthulhu is a little odd to me, only because I'm a fan of Lovecraft, and uh -huh. and and I oh. you know I hear so many stories about you know everyone tries to turn it into uh, you know playing basically playing D&D &D and being monster hunters. But 
if you, you know, the source material isn't like that at all. Oh no, not at all. Um, so it's funny because if you read the books, it's really about one person, the, the protagonist, and they're telling you this horrific story that happened to them and how they lost something or lost somebody. And uh, that doesn't always, that's not something, unless you're doing a one-on-one -on -one game, which you can do with Call of Cthulhu, um, if you have a group of friends, you have to figure out why are these people together? Why are they looking into things that are driving them insane? Um, a lot of times, uh, like, okay, for my, for my 1970s cop show, um, everybody is in the same unit and they go out and they look for all a Cthulhu, uh, uh, for Cthulhu mythos things that are going on. Um, and then for like we did a cyberpunk game where everyone was in a hack cell where they were trying to take down these uh, my my goo uh, my go uh, terrorist uh, organization. Um, so you have to figure out a way, a way that the reason why they're together and why the hell would they go and, and look into this thing, uh, look into this problem. A lot of times it has to do with the fact that they don't know what they're getting into. They don't know about the, the monster. That's why Call of Cthulhu works so well with like one shots or maybe three games or six, because you can arc it and then go, okay, you know nothing. And you see, so, uh, you know, a dead body and then maybe a cultist that killed the person. And then you, you look into the cultist and suddenly, and um, no Larsa tap, <laughs> however you get there. <laughs> Yeah, so that it's definitely on my radar to play a game, and like I said, I just want to see how it plays out, because I find like I find a little bit irksome because I, I feel like there's a lot of people that are Cthulhu fans that have never actually read any of the Cthulhu books. <laughs> right, and that is a that is an issue. I think that you can't, um, like on my bookshelf, I've got the I've got the the annot annotated you know lovecraft stories and then i have all of this other stuff um you have to read the stories uh especially like uh mountains of madness and uh beyond the mountains of madness um um which is a campaign and then um Innsmouth and, and all the classics it's 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 worth now i will warn people that have never read read lovecraft um you know, so, you know, some of his stuff is is hard to get through, um, uh, especially with uh, modern eyes. But you got to remember, most of this stuff was written in the 20s um, and 30s. So just keep that in mind as you're going through. It, it is a it's it's an an old writing style. That yeah, that's for sure. Well, and from what I heard, he didn't like editing. Like um, he was he was friends with. Um, Robert E. Howard, right, from Conan, and and Robert would rewrite his stories um, if they asked him to, whereas Lovecraft was like, no, this is perfect the way it is. <laughs> um, and so I think that, you know, there's a time travel game going back into time and, and making Lovecraft uh, like an editor on. I don't want to do it. No, you're, this is your editor and, and he's going to help you. <laughs> It must be edited. It, it must be edited. Be edited. <laughs> I, I actually, and honestly, I, I've taken a lot of that stuff in. I read, so I, I forget which one of the books I've read, but I, most of his stories are short stories anyway. And then I've also listened to audio books, pretty much like right. audio book, all the things nowadays. It's a lot easier. It's a lot quicker. Um, AJ in the chat just said he had an unusual writing style for his time. And absolutely. Um, so did Robert. Both of them, both of them had their had their uh, their own kind of feel to them. So he was uh, they were definitely ahead of their time in a lot of ways. Well, it's the same thing if you go back and you're reading The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And yeah. while I enjoyed the movies, I don't know that I could go back and read the books and enjoy them the way I did when I read them the first time. The pacing's very slow, you know. It's that you know, it's not action-packed stories like you get nowadays, which I prefer. 
Right. He was writing, um, he was writing a mythology. Um, what my wife does is when she reads them, she skips over any singing or Bombadil stuff. It's like, oh, Bombadil's here. I'm going to now skip down to where he's not. And, <laughs> and that makes it go a lot faster. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> like and, and that's the other thing too like people want to do like the epic like lord of the rings style game for your dnd game well i'm like all right but you better all take the running feet if you're playing third edition because that's all they did yeah. <laughs> they ran away for the most part they added a lot of fighting to the movies that really wasn't there yeah if you cut and even with the movies if you were to cut out all of the wide shots showing you how wonderful new zealand is of them going across the plains you would suddenly have a movie that was 30 minutes shorter because you did a lot of these like epic long running uh, sequences. So, uh, so, uh, so it was, yeah, uh, yeah, he was ahead of his time as far as pioneering fantasy, but yeah, you know, really it's just, you actually just hit the, hit the nail on the head. He was rewriting a mythology, right? That's, that's what he did. Yeah, I, he took from folklore and mythology and then told a story around that stuff. Yeah, an Anglin, an Anglin mythology that that kind of, you know, the Greece and Egypt and and uh, they had King Arthur, but I think he wanted to take it kind of a step further and do something that was, you know, spoke to him about England and his and the whole and the whole thing, you know. Now, you had mentioned briefly about. Uh, wanting to do a podcast or you're going to start doing a podcast we're we're towards the end you want to go into that a little bit before we get out of here sure um uh i have uh four great uh players that we're going to be doing call of cthulhu it's going to be set in 1890s um uh around a seance group um my wife uh is playing michelle uh michelle otis uh we have uh terry Kelsey and uh, Max. So we have, uh, um, it's an all female cast of players and, and they're going to be part of this seance group that slowly finds out about Cthulhu. Um, the first set is going to be probably six to 10 episodes. And then we're going to switch games. We might do time watch. We might do, you know, um, time watch is gumshoe. Uh, we might do uh, D&D. It just, it really depends on what we decide and what people are, are enjoying listening to. And where would be the best place for, you, for people to connect with you in order to find that when it happens? Uh, Twitter is definitely uh, just at Plate Mail Games is my Twitter, uh, uh, my Twitter handle. And then um, you can go online and you can go on the Plate Mail Games website and sign up for emails if you want um i'm kind of facebook has become just crap because it doesn't let you talk to your people without paying them a lot of money so um uh, i'm thinking about just starting a group there to talk about audio and gaming at some point um, yeah i don't have the plate mail website in the description i will get that there that's so fine to make it easier for you guys but the twitter account is there and drive through rpg as well so you can track it that way and if you happen to be watching this later, then the, the platemail.com link will be in there for sure. One last, I mean, just because I want to just let people know, um, we're going to be doing, last year we did a audio set for Numenera, uh, which is uh, Monty Cook's setting. Um, this year, I'm uh, February 15th, I'm starting a Kickstarter for Midgard, which is Cobalt Press's um setting which i'm really excited about it's all fantasy it's gonna be a lot of fun um so if you check out the twitter page you'll get updates on that and then we'll be doing the the midgard audio collection for old press yeah I'm, I'm sure we'll be sharing that around we're friends with wolfgang and dan yeah Dylan he's great those guys over there so we like to yeah he's share awesome so well, I, want I to appreciate thank you for that. coming on, Wes, and thanks everyone for watching. It's been fun, and until next time, stay nerdy. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye.